Hello, it's the fourth Friday Q&A. Um, possibly quite a long one. I've got a lot of questions here. Some of them are left over from two weeks ago. Most of them are from last week because I didn't get to do this video last week because I was ill. I am better now. Thank you to everyone who wished me get well and stuff like that. Okay, one that I missed from two weeks ago. Mr. Buck, 295. Uh, have you now or ever thought about getting insurance for your equipment in case of fire or theft? I have thought about it, haven't actually done it. Money. Um, insurance companies are kind of weird as well. That they, they, they have a tendency to look on things like obsolete electronics as uh, having no value. So um, I think it would be a tricky one. And I haven't investigated further because I can't afford it anyway. So, uh, yes and no, I think, is the answer to that one. I mean, con we've got contents insurance here. So, I mean, if they did recognise the value of this stuff... Mm, I don't worry too much about theft. It would be a very crazy person who broke into this house, given the dogs we've got here. Um, <clears throat> yeah, they're big and loud and protective and <laughs> would probably eat anyone who came in if they didn't know them. Yeah. Next question is uh, Snaztastic. Is the Commodore 64 GS worth the money? I can answer that in one word. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. They sell for ludicrous money. You, you can see that there. I've got one. I paid a tenner for it at a car boot sale back in the late 90s. And it was worth a tenner. They now sell for... I've seen one sell for about 300 quid. Uh, which was insane. I've seen someone try to sell one for 700 quid and it didn't sell. And they were having a laugh. Uh, ridiculous. No, no, they're not worth the money. As a games console, they are a piece of junk. Uh, the best system of its kind, of that type, like a, con a consoleized computer, I think, is the Atari XCGS. Because you can play the cartridges for the computers, you can play the tapes for the computers if you've got the tape drive. But the C64GS, the, the cartridges, you can't run standard Commodore 64 cartridges on it. Which renders the whole thing stupid. There's someone at the door, for fuck's sake. Uh, there we go, that was the postman. There's something very strange about being called Love by a big, tall, ginger-bearded guy. Northerners. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, no, it's not worth the money. They're, they go for silly money and they're an impractical and rubbish console. So unless you are a serious collector, you would not buy one to play games on. There is no absolutely no reason to buy one if you just want to play games because everything you can get on it you can get on the Commodore 64 which you can do a lot more cheaply so uh, no uh, <clears throat> I only have one because I got it years ago before they were stupidly expensive I'm out of breath here I just ran back up the stairs excuse the swearing because of the knock on the door I may have edited that out but I swore <laughs> I hate being interrupted while I'm recording it takes a it takes an amount of effort to get into the right frame of mind to do this and then being interrupted breaks the spell mm. right leo ds do you play your portable consoles at home or do you rather just play a regular console at home and handhelds only on the go i prefer to play a proper console at home but that doesn't mean that I always do. I do occasionally play handhelds while I'm at home. It, it, it depends very much on the circumstances. Sometimes I'm required to be a little bit sociable. And that means I can't hide myself away up here and play on my PS3 or, or whatever else. Even though I might feel like doing that. Sometimes I'm required to... Be physically present in the room, even if <laughs> I'm not in any way involved in the conversation. Um, family get-togethers often involve... Well, let's put it like this. My family here are all work in education. 
Um, my wife, her two daughters and son, they're all in education, one form or another. Um, and th when they get together, they like to talk shop. Which leaves me like, pfft, well, I've got nothing to say on the matter. I mean, I, I know quite a lot about it because I, I have heard it all. You know, I, I listen to the conversations and I get to hear all about it. But I have nothing to add. I have no experience, I have no qualifications, I have no working knowledge of it. So when they're talking shop, it would be rude of me to just leave the room. Sometimes I actually am rude and I just leave the room. But, you know, sometimes it's like I, I should be there. So, uh, yeah, then I will sit and play a handheld. <laughs> it might seem incredibly ignorant, but I think, fuck it, if you're going to talk shop, something I know nothing about and have no part in, I'll just sit here and play a video game. You know, I'm in the room, you can speak to me if you want to, but uh, I'll just do my thing while you lot do your thing. That kind of circumstance, yeah, I will play a handheld in the, while I'm at home. I prefer to just, their main, their, their main use for me is, well not so, they don't get so much use now, I mean I used to use them on the train, or uh, I don't really take the buses around here, I used to use the buses when I lived in Milton Keynes, but around here not so much, but yeah I used to sit and play Game Boy Advance on the train if I was going to Sheffield or something, but now I drive, so they get less use. I would say now I use them on holiday, but I haven't been on holiday for quite a while. Um, the dog's got a bit of a handful, and we couldn't rely on other family members to look after them. I say rely on, it's not that they weren't willing, it's that the dogs were too much of a handful, and it takes a steady hand to take those two dogs in hand when they get out of hand, <laughs> they, they, they started fighting. And really the only person who could get them apart is me. So, uh, yeah, no holidays. And we won't put them in kennels and stuff like that because just don't want to. So, uh, yeah, the, the handhelds, they don't get a massive amount of use at the moment. Except where I... Well, last night, actually... Um, Sometimes I just feel like I want to play that game and it just happens to be on a handheld and last night I sat here for um, About 45 minutes I think playing Star Fox 64 3D on the 3DS. It's the first time I've played the 3DS in a while uh, I Most of my handhelds haven't had a lot of use in a while because since I got these actually my eyes uh, I'm short-sighted but to use a handheld without reading glasses, I have to hold it there, and that's pretty awkward. And with these, uh, I've got bifocals, it's about there, and that's still too close. It's just awkward. But I've got a new pair of um, reading glasses. Yay. Um, and they let me hold a handheld about there, you know, basically in my lap instead of in my face. And since getting those, playing a handheld is a lot more comfortable. It doesn't give me a pounding headache after like 15 minutes. So uh, I have been playing them more while in the house, just because I can, I think. Um, yeah, if I feel like being downstairs and I want to play something and Andrew's watching the telly. Uh, yeah, they, they do get played a bit more. Um, Fixato. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. A uh, couple of questions. I noticed your Sinclair shirt on your last video, which made me wonder, what is your favourite retro system related shirt or piece of clothing? Do you know what? I don't know. And it's funny, actually. I really like that Sinclair t-shirt. And the funny thing about it is, in the video I was asked, I can't remember what it was I was asked, probably what is my favourite 8-bit system like Commodore 64 Amstrad Spectrum and in that video I said I don't really like the Spectrum yet there I was wearing a Sinclair Spectrum t-shirt and how... <laughs> why am I wearing a t-shirt of a system I don't especially like especially when it is actually my favourite, probably my favourite retro t-shirt I... Uh, uh, it's up there I can't be bothered to get it down, it's too awkward, I've got too much stuff in the way. The rubber keyed 48k Spectrum, as an object, 
as a physical object I think is beautiful. I love it. It 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 just triggers a nostalgic part of my brain that makes me feel good when I look at it. And there are some games on it, Jetpack in particular, that are perfect. That, that, that to me is like, yeah, I don't care about most of the other games on the spectrum, but Jetpack on the 48K or even the 16K rubber keyboard, that to me is a part of gaming heaven in my brain and that's why I love that Sinclair t-shirt. Most I, I can watch Spectrum video game videos on YouTube and I'm like meh don't care I really don't but there are just certain specific bits memories things you know I can go there and play Jetpack now and I'm in heaven um, so yeah I think that Spectrum t-shirt probably is my favorite which is bizarre but uh, there you go. Question two. Do you occasionally watch demo scene productions from or for any of your systems? For instance, the audiovisual demos at groups like Fairlight, ASD, Insane, I don't know how to pronounce that, still released during demo parties? No. In short, I don't. Um, I used to like playing the Amiga demos, AGA. Amiga demos back in the day when I was like using my Amiga 1200 tower thing as my main system and, and it was set up and running most of the time um, I would I would play the demos that came on the cover discs of the magazines I would look at them and think wow that's impressive but these days though I know they do some impressive stuff and I was watching a Commodore 64 demo recently that was... There I am, I've, I've just made a liar of myself because I watched one. Ha! <laughs> it was on YouTube. I certainly don't ever download anything or run them on the systems, but I watched a video of one, though it was probably the first demo I've watched of anything in a long time. As a rule, no, I don't do it. Occasionally I see a demo and I think, wow, that's cool. I saw a ZX81 demo a few years ago that I thought was great. But... um as something that I set out to look for, I, I don't. Sometimes I just accidentally stumble on one and think, that's good. But I don't look for things like that. Um, it mostly, it's not part of computing or game, a, a part of computing or gaming that uh, is not on my radar. Yeah. Okay. AC5015. With all the social media like Facebook, and since you've obtained a substantial viewership on YouTube, have you had any subscribers or Facebook friends do or ask anything super creepy? I know you've had run-ins with people adding you to groups on Facebook or trying to run your channel, but has anyone done something that made you feel downright unsafe? No. No, they haven't. Um, there is the occasional little bit of over-familiarity every now and then, um, but never anything that I might work. I mean, I've had death threats, but you just look at them and think, twat. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, that's just trolling. That's not... You don't think, okay, this... You know that person's just being a twat. You're not sitting there thinking, wow, this person's cracked. They might actually... Uh, pose a threat to me, I, because the ones who pose a threat are probably the, not the ones who are being threatening, they are the ones who are being overly familiar, and yeah, but uh, no, um, I, I, I guess, you know, there are times where I might be sitting there and feeling just a little tiny bit edgy, but I mean that's kind of like actually more, more in person on occasion, <laughs> but that's not them, that's me, because I don't people. No, no, never felt downright unsafe. Not, not ever. I'm probably going to find myself inundated with maniacs now. <laughs> Yay. Okay, moving on. Chris James. Me oh yeah, th this is a good question. I remember this. Many people measure their lives in music and associate music with certain periods of their lives and have a real emotional attachment to music as a result of this. 
although I like music, I don't really do this. I much more associate video games with certain periods of my life. Video games are much more likely to make me nostalgic. As much as I get nostalgic, not really being a very sentimental person. So, do you have this sort of relationship with mu music, or possibly films, or just with games? And if you do have it with music and or films, is it stronger, roughly as strong, or less strong? Hope that makes sense. It does make sense. I understand completely what you're saying. Um, the nostalgia feeling, the whole being taken back, almost flashback for me, is the strongest with music. Very, very little with games. Very little with films. There is only one film that... No, there are films that pr promote a strong emotional response, but that's because of the film itself, rather than a, a nostalgic thing transporting me back to when I first saw it. There, I suppose that I see the odd film and I'm like, wow, I haven't seen this since... Yes, um, yeah, there is a film actually that took me back to when I was a very young kid because I just stumbled across it recently. I, I had this memory of a monkey, a monkey eating some kind of water weed with bubbles in it and, and there was water and a guy in a space suit and the monkey eating what looked like toothpaste but it wasn't and I, I have had this memory for all of my life and didn't know, I knew it was a film but I didn't know what film and somehow or other I stumbled across it recently and it was Robinson Crusoe on Mars and I think you can find it on YouTube actually, I'm pretty sure it's on YouTube um, or is it on, no, it's Netflix isn't it it might be on both actually. Anyway, I, I watched it again recently when I found out what it was. And that takes me back to, I must have been four, four or five years old, something like that. I remember watching it on a Saturday morning. Um, yeah, but mostly g games, no, I, uh, sort of sometimes. I mean, I, I, I can play a game and remember the first time I played it or where I played it something like that, but there's no real nostalgia. For me, music, I mean, actually the strongest, but probably least frequent thing that really gives me a flashback is smells. I remember, where I, years ago, I worked in a Tesco warehouse in Milton Keynes, and there was this smell that I think was biscuits. I think I was near a pallet where maybe the packaging had been broken on a pack of biscuits, a certain kind of biscuit, I don't know what it was. And uh, instantly I was back to my grandmother's house when I was a very young kid. Uh, and that was incredibly powerful. I was just, I mean, I just, I was on a picking truck. I was trundling along, doing like five mile an hour, supposed to be picking stuff into a cage on the back of the truck. And I just stopped and was like, holy crap, why am I thinking of my, what's, what's with my grandmother in this place? It was freaky. Um, but music, yeah, yeah, there's loads and loads of music that takes me back to certain places. Um, I can think of some specific ones. And th frequently they actually remind me of a person. Um, or I'm thinking of a person while I'm in a certain place or something like that. There is a um, big country. Uh, in a big country and probably fields of fire. This puts me uh, in an area around Stony Stratford, actually Galley Hill, um, a certain friend of mine it reminds me of. She's watching, she might even know who I'm referring to. I don't think she watches these, she watches Benway's World. Yeah, Tracy, ha, you even know why, probably. And then big country Steel Town reminds me of mm. late evening, early night time on my motorbike in West Bletchley. Because I, I don't think I was riding my motorbike with a Walkman, but I'd been listening to it and I had that music on the brain while I was in that particular area. And the same with um, U2, October, from the album October, reminds me of a place called Parsonham just out in between Dean Tanger and Stony Stratford in Milton Keynes, though it wasn't actually in October. I'd just got the album, but it was 
November, maybe even December. There was snow on the ground, the snow was quite deep. Um, and I was on my little moped and the snow was so deep and the moped had running boards. It lifted the wheels off the road so I couldn't go any further. Yeah, and I had October on the brain. When Doves Cry and Time After... Yeah, When Doves Cry by Prince, Time After Time by Cindy Lauper. Yeah, in my bedroom, and I'm, I'm about 14, 15, something like that. Maybe 16, but I think I'm about 15. Yeah, they, they remind me of a girl who I knew on the CB radio, who I was kind of into, but eh, nothing ever went anywhere there. But I was sort of teenage angst or maudlin and whatever, because I was crap with girls and I was into this girl and I just didn't know what to do about it and clumsy and there, yeah, nothing nothing ever happened there. But uh, those songs remind me of that. Yeah, it's, it's all, it's 80s mostly. Oh, but no. Um... Um, what is the first track? In fact, no, pretty much actually the whole album of uh, The Cure, Disintegration. Oh, God, yeah, well, that just puts me down the river in Stony Stratford with a bunch of friends. We were having an after-party party. We'd been partying the night before, really got absolutely hammered. We all had chronic hangovers. And I had this uh, boombox, shall we say, ghetto blaster, whatever you want to call it. And we went down to the river in Stony Stratford with a case of cherry coke. It was just like, OK, we're all hungover. We feel like shit. It's a lovely day. So let's take some music and some cherry coke and we'll go and sit down the river. And we did. And we were just we had disintegration on repeat. Just played it over and over and over was laying crashed out on the grass, hung over, drinking cherry coke. It was great. And that, that, that reminds me of another one. Yeah, um, one song in, the, in particular is the last tune on the album Closer by Joy Division. And that takes me back to a, um, a burned out and partly collapsed old mill house, a water mill in Stony Stratford. I would say by the river, but it's not by the mill stream. We were having a party in there. Uh, there was myself, some friends, a uh, couple of lads, a couple of girls. Who were the girls? I remember Trisha, Scottish girl. Don't know what ever happened to her. And um, Jackie. And who was the other girl? I forget her name. And uh, myself and Andy and Ron and not sure who else. Um getting pissed in this middle of the night, it's pitch dark, it's cold, it was winter, um, and we're in this burned out collapsed mill, it's quite dangerous, um, we've just got a load of beer and we were listening to Joy Division, and it's great, really great. Mm. Yes, okay, as a follow-up question, most people that play retro games played them the first time around. Although I imagine there was the odd person who plays them who didn't. Do you think it's necessary to have played them the first time around to truly appreciate retro games? Or can you enjoy them purely on an objective level without attaching any nostalgia or memories to them? Uh, you don't need the nostalgia to enjoy retro games. The difference is, it has to be a good game. It, it, without nostalgia, it's got to be a good game. With nostalgia, you can enjoy a really crap game. Um, th there are some games that I've got, and I can't think of any off the top of my head. I know there are loads. Um, there are some games that I really enjoy that are absolutely crap. But I love them because of the nostalgia. I played them back in the day, maybe because they were all I had. And, I, you know, with, having played those back in the day, you can enjoy them. But uh, there are lots and lots of retro games that are fantastic and it doesn't matter that they're old. You didn't have to have played them back in the day to enjoy them. Sonic the Hedgehog, that's retro. It's a fantastic game and you don't, you don't have to have, uh, you know, you can come to that fresh now. Sonic's 1 and 2 and I, I don't know about 3 and Knuckles and all of that lot. But certainly the first two Sonic the Hedgehogs, you can pick them up and play them now having never played them before, and they will be fun.
Um, yeah, and in, it's just about the quality, really. Hmm. Okay. Scribble Sam animation. Couple of questions here. I know you don't like Power Rangers, correct. But if you were a purist, would you ever consider giving the original Japanese show that Power Rangers was based on a chance? The show is called Kai... Kaioryu Sentai. Z what? God. Zayu Ranger. Pro no, it's right. It says how to pronounce it here, but I've already tried and failed, so I'm just not going to... And due to popular demand, they've decided to release the Japanese show on DVD in the US with subtitles. I'm not in the US, so I won't get it with or without subtitles. Power Rangers and Zayu Ranger are actually two separate programs, and the relations between the two are solely limited to the suits, the robots, and their aesthetics. Um, would I give that a chance? No, I wouldn't. I'm, I'm just not interested. Uh, time is short. I have so much to do. I'm a... I don't have enough time to do all of the things I would like to do without spending time just looking at things that I might or might not, you know, prior priorities really. The stuff I really want to do comes first and there isn't enough time to do things that I might or might not find entertaining. I mean I know I, I like some weird strange old 80s Japanese stuff. I love the Godzilla films. I think they're great. They're terrible. And the, because of that, they're great. I mean, the modern Godzilla remake films, meh. But the the old Godzilla, man in a rubber suit stuff, love it. And uh, <clears throat> a couple of other things that were kind of related to that. There was some giant robot suit thing. Some something called Jet Jaguar. And I have no idea why it was called that, because I'm sure it was a robot. But anyway, I mean, I like those things. I don't watch them now, because there's limited time available to watch films and now I largely watch films that I haven't seen before that are like new and I don't have time to watch after the ones I'd like to so uh, short answer to your question no uh, question two have you ever watched the Street Fighter movie the one featuring Jean-Claude Van Damme and Kylie Minogue and what are your opinions on it alternatively have you watched any other movies based on video game franchises any good ones any naff ones I have watched that Street Fighter movie on a in terms of quality films you know if you if I wanted to be an elitist bastard and and only valued films that were artistically relevant or, or credible or <coughs> quality films by quality directors with quality actors. If that was all I was interested in, I would say it was a sack of shit. But I can appreciate it for what it was. A kind of naff, kind of silly, fairly low budget, I would say. I'm probably completely wrong there, but it, it, it was cheap. It's a romp. You know, If and I sometimes like just a good silly romp. So in that sense, it, it it did the job. It's like watching an Arnold Schwarzenegger film. You don't expect quality acting, and you don't get it. And so long as you don't go in there expecting Oscar-winning performances, it is what it is, and it does it well. And on that level, I found it entertaining enough. It's a crap film, but some things that are crap are still worth watching, because they're still amusing. Uh, other video game based films. I don't think I've watched any. I can't think of any. Nothing comes to mind. Right. <clears throat> Retro Gamer VX. What was the first old system you went out and bought as an old computer console? Which was my first of each, console and computer, that I bought as a as a retro system. Yeah, I can remember that. The first retro old console that I bought as an old thing that I didn't buy back in the day and keep, but that I bought with the intention of, you know, adding to a retro collection. First console was a uh, Atari 2600 Junior Long Rainbow. That one. That one there. 
I bought that at the car boot sale in the hospital car park in Milton Keynes for, I think it was a tenner. Um, the first computer I bought as a retro, as an old computer that I remember. BBC Micro bought at the same car boot sale and it's not the beeb that I've got over there because uh, it died. Well, it sort of died. The keyboard conked out on it. And this was in the days before I was on the internet and maybe knew anyone who would know how to fix it or anything like that. So, um, I don't know where that is now. I either left it in the loft of... Um, I had a girlfriend in Milton Keynes and I lived with her for a little while and I, I put most of my retro stuff in her loft. It's either still in her loft or it's still in the loft of my flat that I left to come here. Or maybe I threw it away. I don't actually remember. But, uh, you know, it worked for a, a few days, maybe a week or something, and then the keyboard stopped working and that was the end of that. But that was the first old computer that I bought as an old computer. That's better. Soda Stream Cola. Yay. Okay. Retro Gamer Guardian 90. Out of breath, coming up the stairs again. Wow. Getting old. One, I know you like the PS3 a lot, but have you played Valkyria Chronicles? What are your opinion what is your opinion of the game? I have no opinion. I've never played it. I don't know anything about it. Two. When did you move from Amiga to Windows PC? And what was your first Windows PC? Okay, that was in about 2000. Yeah, year 2000. And my first Windows PC, well, it was second hand. I bought it off of a friend for 200 quid. It was a Hewlett Packard HP Brio. And it ran Windows 98. And it had an Intel Celeron. 300 megahertz. It had 32 meg of RAM. I don't remember how big the hard drive was. It was very unstable. I really wanted to like reinstall the operating system, but the mate who I bought it off of didn't have the system disk. I couldn't reinstall it. I was forever trying to fix the damn thing. Just keep it up and running. You could do system restores, I think, and I was always doing that just to keep it going. But I, I kept it for a few years. It was you know, I, I got it because though I could go on the internet with my Amiga, my Amiga didn't have Java or even JavaScript. Uh, I was using an early version of Voyager as my main browser and that had no JavaScript. So I, I wanted that kind of thing. Flash, Java, JavaScript. So I needed a Windows PC. It did the job. It wasn't great, but it worked. So um, I, I kept that for a few years. Never liked it, uh, Windows 98, and it wasn't even like second edition or whatever, it was the original Windows 98. It crashed all the bloody time. I mean, you were probably looking, if you had a day where it crashed less than four times, you were doing well. Where, here I am with uh, Windows 7 on a PC that I've been using for five years? Must be that, getting on for five years. Uh, this thing, it, it actually locked up yesterday. I don't know what happened. I was using Firefox, which I don't normally use. I normally use Chrome. And I clicked the back button on a page while the page was loading a video. And I mean, I'm used to a browser crashing every once in a blue moon. But it actually locked up the whole computer. And I had to hard reset it. You know, uh, because it just, it wouldn't respond to anything. Mouse wouldn't move. It was that locked up. Um, and I just had to turn off the power button. And that's the first time I've had any kind of, a, a whole complete system crash. The first time in years. You know, I, I get used to the odd program crashing once in a very, very, very blue moon. But I've got to say, I mean, this thing really, stability-wise, is rock solid. Windows 7, I really like it. It's, it's, 
I'd still rather use an Amiga, but if I've got to use a Windows PC, uh, this I like. I mean, I, I keep... I wouldn't mind getting a new computer sooner or later if I was able to afford it, but I, um, the idea of Windows 8, God, horrible. Don't want that. I kind of have to wait until the next thing, which probably... Hopefully it will be better. They, Microsoft do that, don't they? They do good operating system, shit operating system. Good op. So it's, I wish they'd just skip the shit one and just do the good ones. But there you go. 911 Gamer. Who is your favourite programmer or software house? I like David Brabham and Suda51. And for software, Microprose and Sensible Software. To be honest, I don't really have favourites. I don't. Um, I don't think about it too much. I suppose um, programmer Eugene Jarvis, I guess, uh, Defender, uh, Robotron and Blaster are fantastic games and Smash TV and stuff like that. Yeah, um, Eugene Jarvis, Software House, I, I guess I would go with Microprose as well just for like um, Jeff Cram and Grand Prix and Knights of the Sky, but mostly I, I don't I don't think about things like that. I'm, I'm more interested in is it a good game rather than who made it. The Retrospective 81. Do you like the original versions of consoles and computers or the later redesigns of them all of them over the originals or vice versa? Like for example the Mega Drive 2, Spectrum Plus 2 etc and so on. I hope that's an interesting and original one. It is and yes, um, no, I definitely like the originals more. I'm not really, I mean, I have some redesigned, remade, whatever. Actually, I suppose really it depends on the system. I like, I like the Mega Drive Mark I a hell of a lot more than I like the Mega Drive Mark II, massively. Uh, the, the Mark I is just a thing of beauty, where the, the Mark II is just like, it's cheap and nasty. Master System, well, I don't know. I think the Master System Mark One is hideously ugly. It's going to upset a few people, isn't it? The Mark II certainly looks better, but it also looks like a cheap toy. But do you know what? It's a cheap toy, so <laughs> so what? Um, PSP, well, I, I love a hacked PSP Go. Yeah, uh, uh, as a, in unhacked form, the PSP Go is the most stupid, ridiculous, demented, moronic idea. Because it's nothing more than a brick once the the online support is removed, which I believe it now is. Um, but as a hacked thing, you know, it, it it's a much later model, and I love it. And I I use my PSP Go, well, I use it. I don't use my uh, either of my fat. Well, no, I've got a fat and a slim. PSPs. Don't use them. Too big. So uh, I guess the answer is it, it It depends very much on whether the redesign is any good or not. Is it better to use it? I mean, PS3, I have two PS3 fat models. I've got the backwardly compatible one and I've got the 80 gig one that came a little while after it. And I like them a lot more than the Mark II and the Mark III the slim and the super slim. I mean the slim looks alright and the super slim is just it looks cheap and nasty. I I had one for a day it didn't work it was a piece of junk it went back. I like the BBC Model B uh, I don't have a BBC B Master um, and I have no intention of getting one because for me they hold no nostalgia whatsoever. Uh, so uh, it yeah, totally depends on the system, I think. Um, varies. I I was I thought I was going. I thought I knew what my answer would be, and it was the always the original. But the truth is not that simple, because when I look at what I have and what I use and what I like to use, I guess I wind up using which one suits me the best, which one serves my purposes most conveniently. Sometimes. I'd rather use a, a Spectrum 48K with a rubber keyboard, even though my Plus 2 loads the games up more reliably. Yeah, there's no simple answer to it. It, it varies. Cardigan Gamer. 
Would you ever consider becoming vegetarian? And what is your views on vegetarians? Thanks, from a vegetarian. Um, I considered it once. I tried it. I went vegetarian for a short time. Well, it was a few months. It was with the whole uh, BSE thing going on. I went vegetarian along with my girlfriend at that time. And I got ill. I definitely had vitamin deficiencies. I didn't know what kind of things I should eat to make up for the meat that I was no longer eating. I, I did a poor job of it. And being not a good cook and quite a lazy person with it when it comes to cooking, yeah, I got ill. And then the thing that, that turned me back to meat was Christmas. There was no way I was not having roast, well it was chicken in fact, don't like turkey. There was no way I was not having roast chicken for Christmas Day. So uh went back to eating meat and have continued to ever since. Um, I totally see the value in vegetarianism from health terms, from a moral perspective, in terms of the cruelty to the animals, in terms of what it does to the planet. If everyone was vegetarian, this planet would be in a lot less trouble than it is in. I see the value of it. I just can't bring myself to do it. I don't eat red meat anymore. Um, this is not a moral thing, because I still eat chicken and fish. Uh, it's for my health. Andrea, my wife, she's a vegetarian, and she will, she will, <laughs> she will tell me how I shouldn't eat meat and stuff from time to time, or have a little dig, and I sit there thinking, shut up, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> Let me enjoy my whatever dead animal it is I'm eating. And I do see how it sometimes is a, to her, it's awkward. Um, it's fine when you're at home, but if you're eating out, being a vegetarian can be a real pain in the ass. If you if you're going to if you go to McDonald's, if you're at the drive-thru, it's a total pain in the ass because you've always got to wait in the grill bay because they've never got any of their vegetarian burgers or meals or whatever ready, and you've always got to wait an extra five or ten minutes. That's a pain in the ass both for the vegetarian and whoever might be with them. Going to restaurants, the vegetarian selection is frequently crap. Um, the thing that comes up an awful lot is... Um, oh God, what? The, there's a thing with rice and the risotto. They keep... It's like a lot of restaurant chefs seem to think vegetarian food means lots of cheese, melted cheese, put cheese in it, put tons of cheese in it, doesn't matter what the other ingredients are, just fill it with cheese and make it thick and sticky. And um, a number of times we've gone to restaurants and it's like been this nasty risotto, whatever, that's been thick and sticky and greasy and there, and she's felt ill afterwards. Chronic indigestion. Um, non-vegetarian chefs who cook for vegetarians should be forced to eat their own food and then maybe think twice about what they're doing because uh, I've tried, you know, ha had a little fork full of whatever it is they've given her and I wouldn't eat it and not because I'm not a vegetarian because, but because it would make me sick I have a pretty sensitive stomach and anything greasy or oily or anything like that that's why I don't eat red meat anymore, partly Cholesterol is the other thing, but uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I see the moral value. I see the the health value. I see the the save the planet value in being a vegetarian. But I wouldn't do it because it's a pain in the ass, and I like the taste of meat. And I get ill when I try. W J W seven o eight. What is a retro console that you as a collector would recommend for a new or for new retro collectors on the cheap, hopefully, broke college guy? What would I recommend as a, to, to a new collector uh, if you don't want to spend oodles of money? Okay, are you collecting hardware or are you collecting software? Or, well, obviously you're collecting hardware because you want the console, but um, Sega Mega Drive is the short answer. Uh, you can pick them up fairly cheap. They're retro enough while being modern enough that the games, you can still play the games and they still are fun now. You don't need the 
rose-tinted spectacles. Some 8-bit systems, you kind of had to be there sometimes. Um, where a lot of Mega Drive games, you can pick them up now and anyone would say, hey, that's a really good game. Uh, Sonic, you know, platform, a lot of, there, there are some fantastic platform type games, there are some fantastic shoot 'em ups as uh, demonstrated by the videos I've been putting up recently. And the thing with the Mega Drive, apart from the fact that you can pick them up at an affordable price, and they're reliable, I think actually the Mark I more so than the Mark II, because the Mark II sometimes has issues with the power socket. If you are on a really tight budget, get an EverDrive cartridge, and then you can... That itself will set you back a few... about £70 or something like that if you're in the UK. I had to ship mine in from America. I got it from Stone Age Gamer. Not being paid to say that. I was just impressed that I was able to order it from America and it arrived here really quickly. Um, get an EverDrive. Stick a 2 gig SD card in it. And you can put every Mega Drive game and every Master System game into that one cartridge. Massive retro gaming collection. Play, play it on genuine hardware. And that's great. Or if you, if you want original cartridges, well you can pick them up boxed or unboxed still at a decent price. You look on eBay. You can get tons of them really quite cheaply. Some of the rarer ones are getting quite expensive. Some of them are ridiculous. A Glay Lancer that I played not so long ago. I, I mean, I got it on the EverDrive. I never thought to look at what it cost on eBay. Oh, frightening. But uh, yes, Mega Drive gives you lots of options and it's affordable and reliable and the games are good. That would be my recommendation. Gundam UK. If you were given access to a top-notch game development team and given complete control over what kind of game you would make on any gaming platform you like, with an infinite budget, what kind of game would you make? Aha! I know exactly what game I would make. I've talked about this actually a little bit. I would make... It would be on a VR headset Android powered, we'll, we'll say Android from a few years from now, so it's maybe got PS3 quality graphics, something like that. Um, and it would be a sandbox game based in real world locations. I mean, preferably, if, if you've got a limitless budget, well, let's have the whole of the United Kingdom. Yeah, but particularly Milton Keynes and Sheffield, and maybe Northampton. Places I grew up or live now or spend time now. Basically all the places that I know. <laughs> but uh, preferably just like <sighs> Google Maps, Google Street View, but in real time three-dimensional. Somehow they need to like map the Street View and take the whole of the United Kingdom and put it into a first-person virtual reality sandbox game where you can do anything. You've got believable uh, AI in-game characters, or even it's massive. Maybe it's massively multiplayer, so you've got real-world people in there as well. And you can twat about. You can you you can do whatever you like. You've got guns. You've got cars. You can have whatever you like. You can steal cars. You, just free for all, completely and utterly. And it doesn't matter if you kill someone because they just respawn. Yeah, absolute free-for-all, real-world, virtual reality. That's what I would do, based in Britain. And if they want it in other countries, they can damn well make their own. Altec81. Couple of questions. What is the hardest game you've ever played? Uh, I don't know. The hardest game I consistently go back to is Defender. I may have played some ga I know I've played some games where I've, like, at the very start of the game, I've been dead in maybe half a second. But I just think that's bad game design. No game should kill you the moment you spawn. And I can't remember what that game was, but I know I've got a video of it somewhere. But generally, if there's a game that I find too hard, I never go back to it. But 
I do consistently go back to Defender. It is rock hard, but I love it. I think it's fantastic. Uh, there was another question, wasn't there? Cartridges, optical media or cloud gaming? What would the game industry look like if Sega still produced hardware? Oh, it wouldn't be cartridges. They'd already left cartridges. I would hope it would be optical. I would hope it would not be cloud gaming. I think cloud gaming is horrible and not the way of the future because it means you don't ever own your game. It means you're at the mercy of the company you've paid for the right to play that game. As soon as they go broke, shut down, just decide we don't want to support this anymore, it's gone. I mean, look at OnLive. Uh, there will be people who paid for games. It, it, does it still exist? I don't know. But I mean, look at... Um, what's it? Amazon Kindle. The number of people you hear about who have had a big collection of books and videos and music and stuff on their Kindle or on their Amazon account and Amazon have said we detected suspicious activity on your account so we have shut it down and people have lost everything years worth of collected material just because they give a corporation access to their account so it might even be stored on their piece of hardware but that that account is controlled by a company and that company decides get rid of all this you can't have it anymore no wrong should not ever happen I don't support that kind of thing I, I think it's terrible and I would hope Sega don't well I mean they're not in hardware anymore so who knows what they would have done but I would hope they would have remained optical I think that for um, home consoles need to remain disc based or something it, it, there's got to be a hard copy that come up with new technology to fit massive amounts on with a decent read write speed great fine you know little cartridge SD style cartridges work on the um, 3DS stuff like that great but give us something solid something physical we need a hard copy as soon as that hard copy goes you're at the mercy of the corporations and you cannot trust them they've proved it they're either going to go broke or they may without justification just shut you down just for whatever reason but I don't know what Sega would have done Writer's Rain Hilly Hello question for you besides music and gaming collecting etc is there anything else you love doing or have done in the past uh, example painting, art, writing, cooking creating games or something else that I haven't thought of Thanks for answering. Only if you want. I want. I enjoy. Um, yes. I mean, I, I have done painting. I was quite an artist for a little bit. Actually, not exactly prolific. I still have two completed paintings in this house. They're in the loft. I would show you now, but I'm too lazy to go up to the loft. I've got two completed paintings and a book that was like uh, sketches and rough paintings. Uh, I will do a video. I've been saying it for a long time. I'll do a video that shows what I did. At the time I thought it was great. I look back at it now and I'm not so sure. There's a certain something to it. Surreal, that's how I would describe it. It's very, very, very Salvador Dali influenced. Uh, I do music, or I did music. I haven't made or completed any new music in a long time. Uh, I have some like 32 videos on this channel of my music but they're all set to private because copyright trolling is a thing. Bogus copyright claims. They are a problem. You can counter them but if they then counter your counter you can only stop them by getting a, a, a solicitor and you know taking them to court and who can afford that? Uh, cooking? Hell no. Writing? Yes, I used to write. I have had a website with some of my written short stories on it. I don't think that's there anymore. I don't think you can find them anymore. I, I read one. I read one of the stories. On, it's on my Benway's World channel somewhere. Yeah. 
that was quite a good one actually. Uh, probably it was the only one I actually thought worthy in retrospect of doing a video of. Other ones have good bits but overall are uh, not up to much. I used to like fishing, don't do that anymore. I kind of think I'd like to but I don't really like the waters around here and I like fishing when I'm with friends. Fishing on your own, I, I, I used to do it but it was always better to fish with a friend and I don't really have any friends around here to fish with so I don't do that. CB radio used to do that. Not. I can't think of anything else really. I mean, CB isn't a thing anymore, which is a shame. But I mean, the creative stuff. Bit of bit of music. Bit of bit of writing. Bit of art. Hmm. But I don't really do any of them that much anymore. I should, but time. There isn't enough. Lee Birch Garth. Do you ever get recognised by people in the streets? By the way, I have the same Spectrum t-shirt. Good for you. Um, I've only ever been recognised once. Um, it was by a viewer who happens to live in workshop as well, so I suppose it wasn't uh, beyond the realms of imagination that one day I would walk past him and he would recognise me. Uh, he was sitting in his car outside his, the school where his, his kid was. I believe. Um, yeah, I was walking by and he shouted out of the car window, Oi, Benway! And I like looked over, saw where this voice was coming from, walked over, shook his hand, said hello and had a chat. Um, do you remember his name? I do know it. Prey Dog One. Yeah, I uh, don't think I, I may have seen him in, in town well, possibly in Tesco once since then. Uh, only having ever seen him the once before, it may not have been him. It's like memory for faces. Maybe need to see them more than once. But uh, that's the only occasion anyone has ever recognised me in the street. I mean, going to uh, play Blackpool and other gaming events, well, that's easy because people know I'm going to be there and it's not an unusual place for me to be and for people like them to be. But on the street, no. It... And the funny thing is, I didn't even have that big an audience back then. I, I was at about a thousand subscribers then, maybe. But um, it's never happened since. Uh, it wouldn't bother me if it did, so long as they were pleasant and weren't someone I had perhaps banned for trolling. <laughs> that wouldn't be good. I kind of, I dread the day I bump into someone and they're like, Oi, you, you block from me from your channel, you bastard. And I'd be like, okay, what did you do? Um, and then they punch me in the face. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, no, only the once. Wingnut 4427. I know this is old news, but... What are your thoughts and opinions on the Retron 5 debacle? Not sure if you covered this or not. I didn't cover it. My thoughts on it are, what a bunch of fly-by-nights. So they make this console, they've got everyone waiting for it for ages and ages and ages. And then it comes out, and first of all the build quality is shoddy, and I've heard tales of people sending them back because the edge connector is just disintegrating, and they stop working. But also, it's all emulator based, software emulation, and the emulators aren't even their own. They're using, well, they're not public domain, are we? Are they? They're freeware, but there there are license agreements. When you use one of these emulators, you agree not to redistribute it for commercial purposes. And here are the people who've made the Retron Five redistributing these emulators for commercial purposes. Um, so basically they're breaking all the rules uh, uh, and the hardware itself is shoddy. I think it's shameful. It's a shame um, because as a concept it's fairly cool, I guess. Um, personally I wouldn't want one myself. I think if you're going to use hardware I would rather use the original hardware. If you're going to use... Using a Retron 5 is no different than having a PC full of emulators, except it's less reliable. So to me, it, it the fact that it's a shoddy piece of kit using basically stolen software uh, is just one more reason to turn my nose up at it. Not impressed at all. 
piece of junk but by a bunch of fly-by-nights. Ho-hum. V Westlife. Have you ever played or had any interest in text adventure games? And back in the day, did you type in basic programs from listings in magazines? Uh, yeah, I do like text adventure games. I've got a few videos of some on this channel somewhere, mainly on the BBC Micro and Acorn Electron. Uh, I, I'm not good at them. I don't spend lots of time with them, but I love making videos of them because... They just invite you to take the piss, which is exactly what I do. You know, uh, you can type in any old nonsense and they'll probably respond in a predictable way like, I don't understand. But it's fun. Uh, it makes for good videos. And I, I used to play them back in the day. Twin Kingdom Valley on the Acorn Electron. That was a favourite. Did I ever type in basic programmes from listings magazines? Yes, I did. And I particularly on my ZX81. I didn't have a tape deck that I could use with it, but I would type in like 1K games because it didn't take all day and with 1K there was less opportunity for the typical errors that either got printed in the magazine or the <sighs> crept into your typing. But uh, I, I did a, like a Canyon Bomber or City Bomber on, on a 1K ZX81 and it sort of worked in that your plane would fly across the screen and you could drop the bomb and it would flatten the skyscrapers. That was cool, that worked. The the crappy thing about it was it had no collision detection in terms of here's your skyscraper, here's your plane, your plane just flies straight through it and doesn't explode. <laughs> so uh, it didn't matter whether you bombed them or not, your plane kept going and that was sort of crap. That's the one that I really remember typing in. I remember a friend of mine who lived across the road, he had an Acorn Atom. This was his first computer. He had an Acorn Atom and I went round his place and I would read out the code and he would type it in. And we sat there for several hours typing in the code for a... Um, what was the game? The game was meant to be um, a centipede kind of thing. Uh, several hours of typing, it typed it all in, but it didn't work. Uh, either the code in the magazine was wrong, or we, we couldn't see anywhere in what he'd typed that didn't match what was in the magazine, but it didn't work. And that was quite pissy, really. And I, I, I seem to remember several, several attempts at typing things into my ZX81 from um, Computer and Video Games magazine, and they didn't work. And that was a shame. Hmm. Trustef. Yeah, hi, I'm new here. No, you're not. <laughs> I remember playing Battlefield 1943 with you and that was several years ago. Um, I have a question for you. What do you love most? Someone telling you what game you should do a video of or Buying Xbox, or, or, or what? Someone telling me to buy an Xbox 360 console. I assume that's what you mean. What do you, or, or do you mean, do I. What do you love most? Someone telling you what game you should do a video of, or buying Xbox 360 console. Do you mean, do I love buying them, or do I love being told? I'm going to assume you mean, and I know you mean what pisses me off most. I hate being told what game I should play. You, it's the whole you should. You should play this and you should play that. And then others, you know, saying you should get an Xbox 360 also pisses me off. I'll tell you what pisses me off most is people telling me I should play a game that's on the Xbox 360. That, I'm just like, for Christ's sake, pay attention. How many times I haven't got an Xbox 360 and I'm never going to? Stop it! Worse, I'll tell you what's worse than that, is someone telling me I should play a role-play game that's on the Xbox 360. Yeah, that that's the worst. That's really, really... And that just proves that you're not new here, because you wouldn't have known to ask that question otherwise. <laughs> uh, nice to have you around. 
I do know who my long-time viewers are. Um, Guitar Hero 1885. Do you play Hearthstone? Hearthstone? If so, what do you think of it? Think of the different strategies, cards, and if not, this question ain't going to be on <laughs> Friday. Worth a look, it's a good game. T tell me that game's not on the Xbox 360. No, I, I know nothing of this game. I've never played it. I don't know what it is. But if it's got strategies and cards, I never will because I, I don't do strategy games. I don't do card-based strategy games. Um, they're one of my least... I have there are a few things I have less interest in, so uh, and if it's on the Xbox 360, well, <laughs> yeah, ain't gonna happen. Grim and Green, a bit random I know, but I was listening to the radio at work and they were discussing body language. They mentioned a third called st what? They mentioned a third called Sterling. I don't understand. Where someone interlocks their fingers and forms a steeple. <laughs> well, I'm sitting here with my fingers interlocked. I thought, hang on, that chap off YouTube that I like watching does that. Yeah, I do. It It's supposed to be a sign of extreme confidence. Are you aware that you do this? And do you believe all this, bloody, all this body language stuff? Hope this doesn't make you feel self-conscious. On a side note, where did you get your at at t-shirt from? I want one. My wife got it for, for me, and I don't know where. Um, yeah, I, I do this, and I do this, and I do this. and Yeah, I'm aware that I do it. I wasn't entirely aware that it means self-confidence. But now that you say that it does, it doesn't surprise me in the slightest. Um, in real-world social situations I am not a confident person I'm very uncomfortable I don't like being around people I avoid it wherever possible which is strange given how much I enjoy going to play Blackpool but even that I find stressful but sitting here talking to you through this camera I am supremely confident I'm completely in my element for the simple reason that I have absolute control. I am confident in my ability to speak and say what I mean and convey my thoughts in a manner that you will understand and perhaps find interesting or entertaining because of the response I get. I, uh, the first time I did this I, I was very nervous. If you should ever go back and look at my first talkie video and it's still there I'm, I come across very differently. I wasn't confident. I was very nervous, and I certainly would have been sit, wouldn't have been sitting here like this. Um, but now, no, this this is you're in my domain here. <laughs> this, you know, absolute supreme confidence. I'm like the emperor surveying his domain, sitting here in this room with no people in it. You know, I, I control nothing. But what you see, uh, so yeah, it, it's all about being in control of 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 what you see of me. I guess yeah, you won't see anything that I'm co not comfortable with you seeing, and you don't have that control in the real world. So I'm not confident or comfortable in the real world with people. But here, yeah, it, it doesn't surprise me when you tell me what this means at all. I think that's quite cool, actually. <laughs> and very observant of you. i tell you where... Uh, that ATAT t-shirt. I saw um, a Starship Enterprise version of the same kind of thing. It was like a Haynes Manual Starship Enterprise. Uh, and I saw it in Tesco in their clothing section. So I don't know if they do the ATAT ones there either. Uh, but I don't know where my wife got it. I couldn't tell you. She sometimes does that. Just a parcel will arrive and she'll say, Oh, that's for you and it will be something like that, or like this. I don't think you've really seen this. It's a giraffe with a beer hat drinking through a... I don't know how well you can see it. Yeah. Anyway, Dave Webster. Do you have any memorable experiences of BBSing on the Amiga back in the day? BBSing as in bulletin boards, yes, I do. <laughs> 
two. Um, the first one, uh, talking to a woman in Stockport. I was used to CB radio and talking to people who were up to about 20 miles away. And then all of a sudden I found myself talking on a bulletin board. A uh, chat on, the, on that thing was kind of weird, but I worked it out. I, I was never especially good on bulletin boards. But I was just really pleased to be able to talk via my computer to, supposedly it was a woman, apparently a nurse, in Stockport. On my computer screen. This was before I was on the internet. Uh, and I thought, this is great. But my my most memorable thing on bulletin boards, shockingly expensive, was uh, my first experience of computer online porn. <laughs> I spent 20 minutes downloading one, I can't remember if it was a, a GIF or a JPEG, of a woman with a banana. It took 20 minutes uh, and it came out mangled, it was corrupted so you couldn't really make out anything meaningful um, and all of that, never mind that it was time wasted never mind that it didn't work it was dial up, obviously direct dial to Hong Kong 20 minute direct dial to Hong Kong for a mangled JPEG of a woman with a banana. By God, that was the most expensive piece of porn I ever purchased. <laughs> Never again. No, uh, that, that was, that was, <laughs> I learned a lesson that day. Yeah. Daniel Cordell. What was the final arcade you have ever been to before the gamblers took over and what selection of games did you play on that day? I had to think about this and I, 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 I assume this arcade actually is still there but I could be wrong because I haven't been there. I mean you still come up with the occasional arcade at the seaside. I know there's one in, um, I forgot the name of the place, it's, it's, near, it's near where um, Chipster James lives. Uh, I've forgotten the name of it. Anyway, Worthing. Yeah, there's there's an arcade in uh, the Lido at Worthing, or there was. Um, but the last proper big non-seaside arcade that I spent any time in was in Milton Keynes um, at the Xscape Centre, which is where they've got the big indoor real snow ski slope thing. Uh, they've got a big arcade in there. I went in there with a girlfriend um, quite a few years ago, like before I met Andrea, so quite a lot of years ago. Oh, we're talking about nearly 15 years ago, well, it was probably about 12 years ago, 12, 13 years ago. And the only game I remember playing, I mean we played air hockey, but that's a different thing. Um, we had a go on Sega Rally. Yeah, I mean, even it was out of date even then, as in it, it, it had been around for donkey's years, even at that time. But I mean, it's still, it's still a game. Sega Rally and Daytona USA are two games that, if you're lucky enough to find an arcade with arcade games in it anymore, you'll still find those. And they've been around for, they are so massively out of date, and they're still fantastically fun games and well worth playing. And that was what I played there then. Yeah, Milton Keynes Escape. Center Sega Rally. How do I pronounce this? Sanico Streifengrauer. You have an interesting and very German sounding name. Hi Steve, I've got a Four Friday question. You mentioned in a previous video that Blade Runner is one of your favourite movies. With so many cuts of it around by now, is there one you particularly recommend? And if so, why that one in particular? The one I would like to see, I don't know if it exists. I like the original theatric cut, theatrical cut, the one with the voiceover. I like that, but I don't like the tacked on ending. I like the director's cut, but I wish it had the voiceover. I like the fact that you see the dream sequence of the unicorn, and that is essential 
because without the dream sequence, and they cut that out of the theatrical version, you never st you, you never ask the question, hey, does that mean Deckard is a replicant? Because you see the little origami unicorn that um, Gaff left. It's like, hey, I know your dream. So you, you need the dream sequence. But I liked the voiceover. And then I've seen the, um, the one on the Blu-ray. I've forgotten what they call that cut. Ultimate Edition? Something like that. I don't know. There's the one on the Blu-ray. And that, though it has the best image quality and it keeps the dream sequence and takes out the stupid tact on happy ending, I hate it. I really hate it because they fixed the continuity errors. And the most important continuity error is Bryant getting the number of replicants wrong. Was it was it five or was it four? I can't remember. One got fried through going through an electrical field or force field or whatever. And originally it left you thinking, hold on, he's missed one. There's another one somewhere because you've got Roy, you've got Zora, you've got Chris. One had been fried. Where was the fifth replicant? And then in this Blu-ray version, he doesn't say five, he says four. Or however many, it, they fixed it. But I loved that continuity error because it left you questioning, where's that other replicant? Uh, and they're, oh, I want more life. Father? No! No, no, no! <laughs> Bastard! I don't care if... Obviously they recorded that line originally and had different takes and different cuts and whatever, but no, I want more life. Fucker. That's what he says and that's what he should always say. Don't mess it around. It's like Darth Vader screaming, No! I've never seen that and I never want to. Piss me off. No, if there is a cut, I don't know which one it is. What I want is the voiceover, the dream scene, no happy ending, five replicants go escape, not four. We want that continuity error and Royce says I want more life fucker that would be that would be the perfect one no pissing around with it but if that if that one exists I don't know which one it is uh, it, it aggravates me that that, that, that blu-ray version it looks so good and it is so ruined I can't I can't watch it not like I feel strongly about it or anything <laughs> I have only seen that film without exaggerating, and I'm not exaggerating, over a thousand times. Um, from the day I got it, and for several years, I watched it every single day of my life, at least once a day and sometimes more. Um, how could I possibly do that, you may ask? Obsessive tendencies. Right. Electric Adventures. 16. Do you know I never noticed there was a 16 on the end of your name? Is that there or is that just been added? Whatever. Electric Adventures. Probably a bit late for this week. No it's not. Because here we are. But I was thinking out of what? I was thinking out of the computer or console manufacturers that did not last past the 83-84 crash. Which one do you, would you will say, would you have liked to have went on to produce new models for their hardware, i.e. stayed in the industry longer, like Atari and Amiga managed to do? I I had to think about this for about 10 seconds, and then I thought, no, that's... I, I. Vectrex. Um, it, Vectrex was so unique, and they were working on a colour model. It just never got... they ran out of money went bust because of the crash. Yeah, Vectrex, I think it had so much potential. As a system that could have been developed, Vectrex was special. It could have been fantastic if they'd have kept going. I, I would have loved that. I think I would have liked to have seen a more uh, ergonomic controller. Certainly would have liked to see it in colour. But more than colour, just more memory. More memory, more processing power. The ability to do 3D would have been nice. Um, you know, Battlezone and Star Wars on Vectrex, especially in colour, that would have been great. 
Mm. Uh, Cream and Green. You've probably been asked this a lot, but have you ever bought a console or computer that you thought was rubbish but wanted as part of your collection anyway? Oh hell yes. <laughs> Pro probably a good third of my collection. But uh, the one that... Gamecom. I knew it was shit. I knew long before I bought it, Gamecom is shit. But I want one because I want it everything and I got it and it was even more shit than I thought <laughs> yeah yeah I've, I've got quite a lot of stuff here I mean I've got the, those two little handhelds the the handheld mega drive Chinese thing and then that other little NES GBA whatever emulation handheld thing from China that is also crap um, I knew that they were going to be crap but I got them anyway because I'm curious. Just about every plug and play was well, certainly the um, Famiclone ones anyway. They're, they're, they're fairly crap. The, the ones where they've hacked the ROMs in particular, hacked Famicom ROMs, are never good. And I knew that they wouldn't be great. And I got them anyway because I wanted them. Yeah, uh, it happens quite often. I'm trying to think other things. Well, I knew the Commodore 64 GS was not going to be great, but as it was only a tenner, why not? Uh, other stuff? I don't know what else I've got that I would consider really crap. Mm. Well, I suppose, I mean, ZX80. Is that crap? Its capabilities are incredibly limited, and it cost me a heck of a lot of money at the time. But the fact that it's very, very limited is irrelevant, because at the time, for that money, it was groundbreaking. Um, so, that's a different thing, I guess. But no, I, I knew what its capability was. I knew its capability was very, very limited. I knew it was stupidly expensive, and I wanted it, and I got it. Because I could. Yeah, so uh, have I ever? Yes, frequently. Not recent. well, no, yeah, even recently, those Chinese things. I spend a lot less than I used to. If I'm going to buy something crap now, it has to be cheap, because I don't have the money anymore. Yeah, that is that. Um, if you have any questions, for uh, next Four Friday Q&A, do please put Four Friday at the start of your question because I, I come back to these like several days later and I'm looking for Four Friday at the start of the line so I know whether this is a question or not. If you, if you don't put that, it doesn't stand out, I don't see it, I might miss it. Um, and if you're kind of relatively new, do please check out the Frequently Asked Questions first, link to those down there somewhere so that I'm not repeating myself or, you know, I'm not going to ignore the question, but I might not answer it. <laughs> yeah, that's that. It's getting kind of late now. I've got to go and do some housework before I edit this. Yay! Right, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please consider clicking the thumbs up button. I upload videos daily, so go ahead and hit subscribe if you'd like to see more. To all those who've already subscribed, I'd just like to say a great big thank you.